So recently I've been busy designing and building my own buck converter here. Along the designing and building process I've had to overcome several obstacles. So in this video we're going to cover the basic fundamentals of how a buck converter works in order for you to understand how to optimise it and diagnose certain problems within the circuit. Then we're going to discuss five useful tips you can use when you're building your own buck converters. Fortunately for me, I live in a part of the world where PCBs grow in the wild, but you might not be so fortunate, but that's okay because this video's sponsor is JLC PCB and they've got you covered. JLC PCB is one of the largest PCB manufacturers in the world. Personally, I've always been impressed with the quality and affordability they offer. JLC PCB now offer SMT assembly service, allowing their customers to receive complete ready-to-use circuit boards right out of the box without the need to solder fiddly surface mount components. With a multitude of design options, fast production time, and with five PCBs costing less than a cup of coffee, give JLC PCB your next PCB project. In order to appreciate the challenges of designing a buck converter, first we need to understand how a buck converter controls voltage on its output. This is a buck converter I bought online for around $8. I'll power the buck converter from my power supply, which is set to 32 volts, and then I'll connect my multimeter to the output of the buck converter. If I turn the voltage adjustment trimmer, I can set the output voltage to whatever I want. So far I've demonstrated the principal function of a buck converter, but how does a buck converter lower the output voltage below the input voltage? To answer that we can look up the data sheet for the buck IC, which in my case is a XL4016. The data sheet tells us that this buck IC uses a fixed 180kHz switching frequency and utilises PWM to regulate the output voltage. So let's examine what a PWM signal looks like. I'll grab my signal generator and program it to output a 120Hz PWM signal and connect it to my oscilloscope. At the moment the duty cycle is 50%, meaning for 50% of the time the output is switched on and the other 50% the output is switched off. If I lower the duty cycle all the way down to 1% we can see how the waveform changes. At 1% duty cycle the output is switched on for a very short amount of time and naturally if I increase the duty cycle to 99% the output is basically always on. You might have noticed that varying the duty cycle doesn't actually affect the voltage. It stays at 5.2 volts regardless of the duty cycle. So how does a buck converter use PWM to lower the output voltage then? To answer that I'll grab my breadboard and a few wire jumpers. I'll connect my signal generator to the breadboard and also connect the scope to the breadboard. You can see the scope is displaying a 50% duty cycle PWM signal just like before. Now I'll connect a 470 microfarad capacitor to the breadboard and let's see what happens. With the addition of the capacitor the PWM signal is filtered out and notice the voltage has dropped to 1.7 volts. Let's add an LED to the breadboard and see what happens when I increase or decrease the duty cycle. At first the LED is off and then as I increase the duty cycle the LED is dimly lit and the LED proceeds to get brighter and brighter the more I increase the duty cycle. I'll replace the scope with a multimeter and set it to measure DC volts. You can see I have complete control over the output voltage by varying the duty cycle on the generator. This is how a buck converter controls voltage. In a nutshell the capacitor is averaging out the PWM pulses and thus the maximum voltage is proportionate to the duty cycle. Hypothetically if we have a 10 volt PWM signal and a duty cycle of 50% then the voltage is averaged out to 5 volts and at 75% duty cycle the voltage would be 7.5 volts. Of course in the real world there are power losses to consider and many other factors including current draw but hopefully you now understand the fundamentals of how PWM is used to regulate voltage.
In the case of the LED, the single 470 microfarad capacitor was more than capable of smoothing out most of the 120Hz PWM signal to provide the LED with relatively smooth DC power, since the LED only draws around 20 milliamps. However, if we replace the LED with a load requiring a few amps of current, the capacitor would have to be ridiculously large. And since that is impractical and also expensive, manufacturers design buck ICs to utilise high switching frequencies, typically in the 100 to 200 kHz range, which in turn reduces the size of smoothing capacitors down to a more manageable level. However, this strategy does have its drawbacks. Higher switching frequencies introduce a new issue to combat in the form of electromagnetic interference, aka noise. This is what noise can look like. If I draw your attention to the thick yellow line across the screen, this is desirable smooth DC power. However, you'll notice all these thin vertical spikes. This is unwanted noise, and in a buck converter circuit, it can be a real challenge to completely remove. With that in mind, let's move on to making a buck converter using the schematic found in the data sheet for my buck IC. I ordered some PCBs, gathered the specified components, and went about soldering all the components in place. After assembling the buck converter, it was time to connect it to my power supply and connect my multimeter to the output of my buck converter. And as you can see, by adjusting the trimmer, my buck converter is doing a great job of controlling the voltage. So designing a buck converter is as simple as following the manufacturer's suggested schematic, right? Well, let's replace my meter with my scope and take a closer look at the output from my buck converter. Upon closer inspection, we can see there is quite a bit of noise with a peak to peak value of 128 millivolts. And if we add a load to the buck converter, in this case a bulb, if you thought 128 millivolts wasn't good, how about close to 1000 millivolts of noise? And to add insult to poverty, the DC voltage isn't stable, rendering this buck converter completely unusable. So how do we go about diagnosing and fixing my buck converter? One way to try and reduce noise is to strategically place a few extra decoupling capacitors around the circuit. The schematic already has a 1 microfarad ceramic decoupling capacitors placed on the input and output, so I'll add an additional capacitor between pin 5 and ground. Mounting it as close to the buck IC is important, so I'm going to solder it directly to the IC's pins. I then added one more capacitor between the positive output and the feedback pin aka pin 2. Now it's time to connect everything back up to the buck converter and see if the additional decoupling capacitors have made any improvement. Well that's looking much better than before. This time the noise is reduced to 88 millivolts compared to before at 128. However, we all know the real test is under load. So I'll reconnect the bulb to the buck converter just like last time. With the additional decoupling capacitors, the noise is reduced to 288 compared to before at 944. But more importantly, the voltage is stable and doesn't have these wild dips like before. Now don't get me wrong, 288 millivolts of noise is by no means good, but it's a big step in the right direction. Now imagine repeating this test scenario dozens of times with a seemingly unlimited amount of configurations. You can probably imagine how many hours I've spent trying to perfect the design. Fast forward several generations and we arrive here with my latest version. You might have noticed there are a lot more components on the PCB, and most of them aren't to reduce noise. Basically, this group of components are responsible for the constant current feature, but that is beyond the scope of this video. So let's connect my latest version up to my power supply and scope. With no load connected, the noise is down to a minuscule 14 millivolts. But as I said before, the real test is when we connect a load. So let's bring back the bulb one last time and connect everything up. With the bulb acting as a load, the noise has increased slightly to 38 millivolts. Alright, time to whack a full 8 amp load onto my buck converter and test its limits. Even at 8 amps of current, there is minimal high frequency ripple. The 64 millivolts peak to peak ripple is mostly low frequency ripple that could easily be filtered out with a slightly larger output capacitor if required. These figures are about as good as you should expect from a buck converter like this. Reducing the noise further would be possible with the addition of a larger output capacitor or even perhaps a voltage regulator. However, it's all relative to the application and for most people, including myself, 64 millivolts of ripple at 8 amps is more than good enough. If you're thinking of designing your own buck converter from scratch like I did, here are several design tips.
1. Use quality name brand inductors you can trust. The green toroid inductor here is a quality name brand item with a price to match. The cheap and no-name black inductor uses wire that is too thin for the current specified in the data sheet, and the inductor core is constructed from ferrite, which is the wrong material for this application. So buy quality inductors. 2. Use capacitors that are rated for use in switch mode power supplies. The majority of capacitors, even quality name brand ones, aren't necessarily designed with the intention of being used in high switching frequency applications. Make sure you use a capacitor that has low ESL and low ESR values. Some manufacturers like Nichicon mention in their product data sheets what applications their products are most suited for. 3. Ceramic decoupling capacitors are your friend. We covered this at the start of the video. Be prepared to spend many hours experimenting with adding additional decoupling capacitors in an effort to further reduce noise in your circuit. 4. Plan the layout of your circuit board methodically. Keep all the PCB tracks as short as possible. Lay down top and bottom ground planes to soak up unwanted EMI noise. And keep noisy components such as the inductor and flyback diode away from other sensitive components. 5. It's essential to have an oscilloscope and quality power supply. An essential piece of hardware for troubleshooting buck converter circuits is the oscilloscope. A digital multimeter just won't cut it here. You'll also need a power supply that has minimal noise on its output, otherwise you'll be injecting extra noise into your buck converter circuit, making it very difficult to determine where the noise is coming from. The reason I started to design and build my own buck converter was because I was frustrated at the lack of affordable and high quality buck converters available online. It's very, very hard to find any. I'd be interested to see how many people like myself uh, are interested in buying a high quality buck converter kit set that is easy to assemble. So let me know down in the comments section below if you would be interested in purchasing a buck converter kit set when I've finished the designing and building phase. So if you found the video useful please give it a like it would be much appreciated and consider subscribing down below for more content just like this. Also, if you have any questions, leave them down in the comments section below. Thank you very much to my supporters on Patreon. You guys are awesome, and I will see you in the next video. Bye for now.